All right, folks, what we're going to talk about now is we're going to talk about a very important topic in economics. It's probably the first thing that you think of when you think of economics, and that is money. Got to talk about money. Money plays a very important role in economics, and we have to talk about it. In fact, the fact that we haven't talked about it yet, well, we've talked about money, but we haven't really defined money. And that's what we're going to do in this video. All right, here's the definition that I have for money for you. Money is anything that is widely accepted. in exchange for products by both buyers and sellers. All right, so we understand money in this economy probably as little green pieces of paper or in some different countries. Uh, I've seen um, red ink on, on the paper and technically it's not really even what we would consider to be paper. It's become uh, uh, very advanced. But what you understand and I understand as money is the little green pieces of paper. Even though that is money, it's not all of the money. Okay, and it's not the only thing that can be money. See, money is anything that is, now I say widely accepted. When I say widely accepted, I mean that, that almost anybody, wherever you are, will accept it, will accept that thing in exchange for products. So if you want to go get a soda, that thing, that anything that you have, you would be able to take that anything, hand it to the person who has the soda, and they would be willing to give the soda to you. So, for example, this marker is not widely accepted in exchange for products. So I can't go to a store with a handful of markers and say, well, here's seven markers, can I get a soda? They would say, well, the soda isn't, I'm not willing to make exchange for markers. I don't need markers. I need money. And so markers are not widely accepted as something that, is, that, that can be made in exchange for products. Therefore, markers are not money. And it has to be widely accepted by both buyers and sellers. The buyer of the soda who has the money, I don't have any money on me right now, who has the money has to see value in that, in that, let's say, $5 bill, and the recipient of the $5 bill also has to see value in that $5 bill. And that's the great thing about our, our little pieces of paper with green ink on them, is that both sides see value in that, uh, in that $5 bill, okay? All right, so, uh, but there have been, throughout history, other things that have been widely accepted. For example, uh, jewelry, um, gold and silver, diamonds, so uh, gems and that sort of thing. Geological formations uh, throughout the history of humans have been widely accepted in exchange for products. Uh, oftentimes, for example, in, in societies or in uh, times past, uh, like the Romans, uh, they would take gold or silver, and they would mint the gold and silver into a shape that had, you know, a picture of Caesar on it. And then that coin was generally accepted by everybody, and therefore those coins were considered money. Now, mostly what we talk about these days is what we refer to as currency. Now, currency is physical money. physical money, right? The pieces of paper and the coins, right? But it's important for you to understand that currency is not the only money that we use. For example, you probably have a credit card or a debit card. Let's not talk about the credit card for now. That's, that's a debt instrument. But let's talk about the debit card from your bank. You can go to the store with your debit card, buy $17 worth of stuff, put your card in the machine, and make payment without currency, right? And so that is money. They're accepting your digital money in exchange for the products. 
And what's happening is money is being moved from your bank account into the bank account of the store where you're buying the stuff. And so not all money is currency. Not all money is currency. Okay, and what we're going to talk about later in the semester are different kinds of electronic monies. Okay, in fact, probably most of the money that we have in the world today is electronic money. It's a little number sitting on a computer somewhere, and not all of it is currency. So when we say currency, we're talking about physical money. Okay, now, what's so great about money? Well, money affords you a couple really neat circumstances. First of all, money provides you, provides the opportunity to buy products. And something else it does is it provides you with the flexibility, money provides the flexibility to buy it when you want to buy it. And this is what's great about money. Money is something, now, and I, I want to be clear about something, especially currency. Money is not something that you actually consume. Okay, so money itself is not land, money is not labor, and money is not capital as we understand it in, in economics. Now, sometimes money is referred to as investment capital, but that's a different kind of capital. That's a different definition of the word capital. Money is not a resource that actually produces stuff. Money is something that can be used to buy resources. Businesses can use money to buy land, to buy capital, and then to rent labor, to borrow people to make stuff. Okay, And so businesses like to have money because when they have money, they have the opportunity and the flexibility, these are the two key things, opportunity and flexibility, to buy things when they want to. Okay, And so what we're going to do is we are now going to go over the three functions of money. All right, now we're going to talk about the three functions of money. Another way to think about this is that money in a society, within an economy, money basically uh, uh, fills three roles or has three jobs. The first one is called medium of exchange. So the first job of money is that money is a medium of exchange. Now, the word medium means in the middle. Now, we already know what an exchange is because we've already learned about supply and demand. And we understand that anytime there's stuff, you know, suppliers, they make stuff and then buyers, they get the stuff. Okay. And the problem with um, getting the stuff that you need making exchange is this, is that um, without money, we have to rely on what's called coincidence of wants. Coincidence of wants. And here's what I mean by coincidence of wants. All right, so let's say that you need a shovel, but you have two axes, okay? And you know a guy who has a shovel and he doesn't need the shovel. So you go to that guy and you say, hey, can I get your shovel? I have an extra ax. I'll give you the ax you give me that shovel. And the guy says, well, I'm willing to give up the shovel except that I don't need an ax. So I'm not willing to exchange my shovel for your ax. What I really need is a saw. That's what I need. I need a saw. And so you think, well, I don't have a saw. So now what you think to yourself is I need to go find somebody who has a saw and who wants an ax. So let's say you spend a couple days looking for somebody and you finally find somebody who needs an axe and they have a saw. And then you say to them, hey, I'll give you my axe for your saw. So they give you the saw, you give them the axe. Then you go hunt down that person who has the shovel and you say, hey, I found a saw. Would you now exchange the saw for the shovel? And the person's like, yes, please, I need, the, I need that saw, here's the shovel. So it took you some time. It was very inefficient for you to be able to get the stuff that you need. 
Now, imagine trying to do that with all of the things that you need. Imagine trying to do that with a house, with a car, with gasoline, with food. Tr imagine getting your, trying to get your clothing and a pen and paper for school or books for school or a computer, a phone. Imagine having to find the people who just happen, not only, not only do they have what you need, but coincidentally, they need what you have. And this is what that would look like. That would look like households, okay, and producers, and these are consumers, so we're going to call the producers firms, okay? So the, the people who make stuff, like for example, if you want a cell phone, you would, you're, you're, from a, you're an individual from a household. If you want a cell phone, you would have to go do work for the firm, give them labor. And then after working for them for, let's say, I don't know, three days, they give you a cell phone, right? So you give them your factor of production, and then they give you a product, okay? Now, in order for you to get food, you would then have to go work for a farmer or a restaurant for a little bit, and then they would give you food. Then if you need clothing, you would need to go work for a company that makes clothing. You'd have to work for them for a few days for them to give you some clothing. And, all, and this is what would have to happen. Producers and households would have to basically, the households would have to go directly work for the firms, then get their stuff just so that they can have the stuff they need. But with money... In the middle, with money in the middle of exchanges, we now can have markets, which we already learned about. And here's what that would look like. Instead of having this, uh, this direct uh, coincidence of wants between uh, producers and those who need stuff, um, in this case it would be suppliers and demanders, uh, what we have is money is in the middle of an exchange. And now what we have is this. We now have, here's the households, those are the demanders, and then over here, well, of pr demanders of products, but they're the suppliers of factors of production. And then we have the firms over here, and the firms can provide products to the households, and the households give money to the firms. So money is in the middle of this exchange. In the same way, households, and this is a product, in the same way, households can give factors of production to producers, and then producers can give money to those people who are working for them. And now what will happen is this. An individual can work for the company that makes phones, but then buy clothing from a company that makes clothing. It allows for specialization of labor, which, is, which is, uh, allows an economy to grow more and grow faster, okay? And so money contributes to the economy by smoothing out transactions and making it more efficient for, uh, for buyers to receive the products that they need or for, for producers to receive the factors of production that they need. And, and that is the job of money as a medium of exchange, okay? Um, market exchanges are more efficient. The last thing I want to say is, well, why is it that you are willing to accept money in exchange for stuff? So let's say that, uh, let's say that you're going to go work, you get a job, let's say you go to work for Chick-fil-A, and uh, they agree to pay you $9 per hour. Why is it that you are willing to accept $9 in exchange for one hour of your time? Or let's say that you work six hours one day. So now they're going to give you, um, they're going to give you uh, $54, right? And uh, why are you willing to accept $54 in exchange for your time? Why is it that this little, these little green pieces of paper or little digital numbers in your bank account, why are you willing to give up six hours of your time just for a little digital number that says 54? Well, here's the reason. It's because 
you believe that when you get that money, that you can then take it somewhere else and that it will be widely accepted. You believe that you can take that money somewhere else and spend it and get the stuff that you want. You believe that you can then go over to Walmart and you can buy a pen or buy some clothing or buy something else there, uh, buy some shampoo, and you believe that Walmart will accept that money in exchange. And so, and, and that's true, they will accept it, and that's one of the reasons you work. And so here's the thing, the reason that money has value The reason money has value is because of your faith in other people. Because of your faith in other people. And other people's faith in you. We all believe that each other will accept money in exchange for a product. And therefore, I'm willing, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, you know, I'll, uh, let me buy your car. I'll give you $3,000 for your car. And I might say, okay, I'm ready to give up my car. Maybe I'll get another one or I won't have a car. I'll accept $3,000. I'm giving up a useful object, a car, for $3,000. I can't drive the $3,000, but what can I do with the $3,000? Well, remember, money gives you the flexibility and, uh, and the opportunity to buy what you want, when you want. Why? Because I believe that in six months when I'm finally ready to spend that $3,000, whoever I offer it to will accept it the same way I accepted it from the person who bought my car. And that's why money has value as a medium of exchange, okay? All right, now let's move on to the second function of money. All right, the second function of money is a measure of value. Money is a measure of value. What does that mean, a measure of value? Well, consider this. Imagine if you were trying to compare two things. Have you ever been, you know, think back to elementary school maybe, or, or you know, some situation where you were hanging out with some friends and you guys were all eating your lunch. Have you ever thought to yourself, hey, I'll trade my you know, I'll trade my apple for your Twinkie, okay? And the person might say, no way, man, I don't want an apple. The Twinkie it tastes way better. Or someone may say, yeah, you know, my mom gave me two Twinkies and she didn't give me an apple and I love apples, so sure. People oftentimes then compare what they are exchanging with other people. One person might say, well, I mean, I'll give you the Twinkie for the apple, but you should give me something else too because the apple is not as awesome as the Twinkie. And we get into this in the economy is we compare how valuable one thing is to something else. Well, the problem is, is that we can't actually compare how valuable two things are. For example, how valuable is this towel to this marker? Well, we don't know because this is a towel. We can't compare its size to the size of the marker because they, f they fill completely different needs. And so it's very difficult to compare dissimilar objects or dissimilar products. Okay, so products that are dissimilar are difficult to compare. And so what we do is we convert the value of the products into a money value. Okay, so for example, we can say, well, this towel is probably worth about 20 cents, but this marker is, well, I mean, this marker, it comes in a pack of 12, and the pack of 12 costs about $12, and that means that this marker, brand new, must be worth about, worth about a dollar. But this came in a pack of about 10 for about, uh, uh, I think it was $2, and that me must mean that this towel is worth about 20 cents. Now, what did I just use there to make a comparison? I used the price of the object as the value comparison. And that's oftentimes what we do in the economy is this, is we convert the value of products into a money value. 
And we often use price to do this. We often use the price of the object to do this. And so, and so price now plays an important role. Price isn't just how much I have to give you in order for you to give me the product. Price now is the thing that I can use to tell you how awesome this is or how awesome this is not. In fact, we often do this in society is we say, uh, well, my car is better than your car. Well, why is your car better than my car? Well, because my car costs $40,000 and your car costs $25,000 without making any other kind of comparison. We can then go on to say mine is a better brand, mine has better features, mine's a larger vehicle, whatever. Okay, but oftentimes we begin with price. We use money as a measure of how valuable something is. How valuable is that? Well, I think it's worth about $10. Oftentimes that's the first thing we'll say or something like that because we are using money to measure the value of an object. Okay, all right. And then once we have converted the value of the products into a money value, we can now, money now allows value comparisons. We can now say that you would have to give me five towels for one marker because these are 20 cents each and these are a dollar each. And so if we divide a dollar by 20 cents, we get five. Now, not everybody will agree with that. This is where arguments come in. Oh, well, the value is much higher. The value of my stuff is much higher than what you think it is. And the value of your stuff is much lower. Well, it becomes very uh, normative. And because it becomes very normative, people can get in arguments and deals can fall apart. And it's difficult to value things in terms of money because the value of an object, I want you to think back to the idea of abstract versus concrete. The value of an object is abstract. The object may be concrete, but its value is abstract. Money allows us to make concrete the value of an object. And this is where it becomes very dangerous with human beings because we're not supposed to value human beings in terms of money, but then the first thing we do is we offer people money when we want their time. And then we make the mistake of thinking how much money we earn is our value as a human being. Let me remind you that your value comes from the fact that you are alive and you are thinking and you are breathing and you can't make one of you, so you're valuable. You are not valuable in terms of money. That's just your time for some of the time, okay? All right, so money allows value comparison, comparisons among products by comparing prices. First, we take the products that are dissimilar, we convert them into their price or some other value comparison, and then we can compare the objects by comparing their prices. That is money as a measure of value. Now let's move on to the third function of money. All right, the third function of money is as a store of value. Money is a store of value. What do I mean by a store of value? Well, store, the word store is kind of like the word storage, right? Storage. You can store stuff away. For example, let's say that you buy, uh, let's say you're the kind of person who goes over to Sam's Club or Costco or BJ's to buy, you know, uh, to buy, you like soda. Let's say you like Mountain Dew and you'll buy like four cases of Mountain Dew at a time and you'll store the Mountain Dew in a closet in your house or in your apartment. Why? Because you don't want to have to keep going to the store to buy your Mountain Dew or you want to buy it at, a, at a, a, a price. You want to save up the opportunity to drink a Mountain Dew anytime you want to drink one. You are putting the Mountain Dew in storage and therefore you are storing away the value of that Mountain Dew so that you can use it whenever you want and however you want, right? You can offer one to a friend when they come over, or you can make sure that you always have one available to you, okay? That's what we mean when we say that money itself is a store of value. Each dollar is like a storage unit. A storage unit of what? It's a storage unit of the opportunity to buy whenever and whatever you wanna buy when that opportunity comes up. So here's what we're gonna say. 
Money allows you, as a store of value, money allows you to save the opportunity to buy. So remember the example I gave before, let's say I sell my car for $3,000, I now have that $3,000. I don't have to go use that $3,000 the very day that I get it. I can save that $3,000 up for six months wait and wait to buy what I want to buy. Maybe I'm waiting for the next model of the next vehicle to come out before I buy it. So I'm going to save up that money. Money allows me to save up the opportunity to buy. I don't have to use the money today. I can buy when it is best for me. And you can buy when it's best for you. You may save up your money because you're waiting for the sales. You're waiting for the thing that you want to buy to go on sale. You've been saving up money and you now have $500, let's say, to buy a computer, but you actually want a $900 computer and you know that if you hang on just for a little while that that $900 computer is going to go on sale for $500 and then you can buy it when it's best for you. That's what I mean by money as a store of value. Your money is storing up the value that you have. You gave up your time. That was valuable. You gave up your time for money. You got paid. You saved it up. You stored away all of your value of your time into little pieces of money, 500 of them, and now you can go buy the computer at one time. Also, let's say that you only get, let's say, I don't know, $20 a week, but the thing you want to buy is $300. Well, it's going to take you 15 weeks to save up $20 every week. Well, you can store away $20. Next week, store away another $20. Next week after that, store away another $20. You can accumulate your value into a larger value. That is money as a store of value. Money allows incremental accumulation of value. This is what people do when they save up for retirement. They don't want to spend all of their money right now. Let's say they're 33 years old, they've got some money, they don't want to spend it. They say, man, I'd rather spend this money when I'm 75. So they put that money away and they store away their money. They store away that value so that they can use it when it is... When they, when they want to save up the opportunity by when it's best for them. And for them, it's best for them when they're 75. Why? Because they know when they're 75, they probably won't have a job or they may not have a job. Or they don't want to have a job when they're 75. So they want to save up their value. They want to, they want to accumulate incrementally the value that they are earning in their, in their salary today so that they can spend it later. And that is the third function of money as a store of value. Okay, so that's it for uh, money and the functions of money. Uh, now we're going to move into understanding how money is used in an economy.